Um, so today we are lucky to have Yi Wong. So Yi is now at Hong Kong University. Uh, he's a, um, an associate professor there. And uh, he got his PhD in Beijing and, and he moved to Hong Kong after doing postdocs at Meijil, uh, Tokyo and Cambridge. So he works on a variety of topics and uh, today's uh, talks will be on inflation. So inflation as the cosmological collider. So um, I leave you with, uh, with the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's my great pleasure to be invited online and uh, give this talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about inflation as a cosmological collider. So uh, the first question that you might have by seeing this title is, uh, after all, what is a collider? And can, why can you talk about something cosmology as a collider? So uh, what is a collider? Let us step back to see in general, uh, what do we uh, think a collider should have? First of all, a collider should have something high energy happening in it. So some very high energy process happening, which create heavy particles and let the heavy particles interact. Uh, this is the first element of a collider, but it's not all. So we also have to rely on some long-lived signals because we know that high energy particles correspond to extremely short time scales which is shorter than the response of the detectors. So we have to rely on some long-lived signals to carry uh, what happens on the collider to some detectors. And eventually the detector gave us the signal. Uh, this is a collider. For example, uh, there are man-made colliders such as the LHC and where the leptons, photons, and jets carry the high energy signal, the information to the detectors such as ATLAS and CMS. Now, this is what a uh, collider is like. And very interestingly, our universe behaves almost exactly the same as what we do in a collider physics experiment. What I mean is as follows. First of all, the very early universe can be considered as a source of extremely high energy process. Uh, for example, uh, the inflationary stage of the primordial universe. During inflation, our Hubble parameter, uh, so uh, our uh, universe expands almost exp exponentially, uh, which defines a scale uh, on the exponent, which is the Hubble parameter during inflation, which is almost a constant. So far, we don't know what is the precise value of the Hubble constant during inflation, but we expect it could be very high for example, up to 10 to the 13 GeV. It's extremely high energy scale and the quantum field theory during inflation can be roughly, speak, uh, can be roughly speaking thought of as a finite temperature uh, quantum field theory at a temperature of 10 to the 13 GeV also. Or uh, if you want to do more precise calculation, you have to rely on the quantum field theory on a expanding background. So uh, this is the high energy process. Hopefully in the primordial universe, we do have high energy things happening. And then how do we know this process? For sure, we are unable to travel back to inflation to see what happens. So we have to rely on long lived signals to carry uh, the information about inflation to today. And that corresponds to the conserved quantities in our universe. And fortunately, we do have conserved quantities. For example, the curvature perturbation during inflation, which can be considered as the e folding number difference between different parts of our universe. The amount of expansion between different parts of the universe has a small difference of order 10 to the minus five created from inflation. And that curvature perturbation on another uh, gauge transformation can be considered as also the fluctuation of the inflation field, which is in the simplest model is a single scatter field. And its fluctuation is related to the curvature perturbation. And in the simplest model of inflation, uh, this parameter is a conserved quantity, which after x uh, exit the horizon during inflation until it re-enter the horizon at the late universe, it is a constant. So it will carry to us 
the information about our primordial universe, especially inflation. And uh, the formalism to calculate that is the so-called yin-yin formalism, similar, again, similar to what we do in thermal field theory, but there are uh, uh, technical differences since now we are not really considering a temperature uh, in the particle sense, but in some curved uh, geometry. But nevertheless, what we are doing is we calculate the, uh, some expectation value of the operators as using the time evolution operator to act on the yin state and its Hermitian conjugate to calculate expectation values in our universe at a definite time. Using this method, we can calculate the two-point correlation function, three-point correlation function. In this talk, I'm not going to show in detail how the calculation is done. I'm trying to keep at a conceptual level, but nevertheless, this is the way that if you want to do the calculation, uh, you need to do this uh, formalism. And this is the curvature perturbation. Similarly, there is also the primordial gravitational waves, which after horizon axis is also a constant so it is also long-lived signal. And there might be iso curvature fluctuation corresponding to other masses of very light fields during inflation. So far, we haven't seen iso curvature. We don't know if there, uh, there is any. So they are the long-lived signals, conserved quantities. And these long-lived signals carry the inflation about the information, uh, uh, carry the information about inflation to the detectors. And by the way, uh, the high energy process and the long lived signals, all of them are free. This is different from man made collider. They are just the nature directly provide us. And eventually, uh, the non free part is we have to build the detectors to see these signals. For example, in cosmological observations, such as the cosmological microwave background, large scale structure, and 21 centimeters. And corresponding to the signals that we were, we were mentioning, the curvature perturbation was uh, the, uh, the two point correlation function of curvature perturbation was very well measured from the cosmic microwave background experiment. And in the future, uh, and also now in the large scale structure, and in the future may be measured by great precision in 21 centimeter. And the three point correlation function, uh, in other words, the non Gaussianities has not yet observed. Uh, uh, currently, we have observational bonds uh, bonding the strength of the interaction during inflation. And in the near future, the sphere X experiment, which is, uh, I think, already funded by NASA and they are preparing it, uh, can provide up to 10 times precision compared to now for given shapes of non Gaussianities. Uh, this is curvature perturbation and the primordial gravitational waves. Uh, which is so far not observed, but there are a lot of ongoing experiments, also uh, provide us 10 times or even more precision uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. And for iso curvature, not observed yet, but we have a lot of experiments. So uh, by uh, this diagram, I'm trying to convince you that our primordial universe to current universe, the cosmological observation, indeed, can be considered in some sense as a collider, uh, which provides us uh, information about high energy physics. And the next question uh, that you might want to ask is uh, using inflation to understand high energy physics. So this is totally not a new idea. So ever since inflation was proposed, uh, because of two reasons. The so one reason is the nature of inflation, which is high energy. And also historically, the people who were working on inflation, a lot of them were particle physics. So their interest is indeed trying to find out the particle physics nature of inflation. And afterwards, also a lot of string theorists working on inflation, trying to find out string theory from inflation. So trying to understand high energy physics from inflation, this is not a new story. It uh, begins ever since inflation was uh, proposed a few decades ago. However, now we are talking about the cosmological collider physics uh, since a few years ago or a date back to a decade ago. So what's new in here? Uh, we'd like to comment about the traditional way uh, and the cosmological collider way to extract the 
information about high energy physics. And uh, the traditional way is that uh, we want to first have a UV model. So we'd like to build a, uh, we'd like to have our preferred starting point. For example, string theory or grand unification or whichever UV uh, quantum gravity or unification or uh, whichever motivation that you have. So first you have a UV model and then you build the inflation model out of the UV model. For example, free inflation, for example, inflation from some flat directions from, uh, from supersymmetry, etc. And afterwards, you make predictions from these models, and then you use the observation to test the prediction so that it can test the UV model. Uh, this is very important. I'm not saying it's not important by proposing anything new. So it's very important, especially after all, we want to understand how inflation works. So it's very important to build the UV model of inflation. However, by using this method to uh, understand the high energy physics of inflation, uh, there are some difficulties. The biggest difficulty, I think, is that there are so many inflation models. I don't know if there are thousands, but I'm sure there are hundreds at least inflation models. You can have all kinds of inflationary potentials. You can have all kinds of different uh, the number of fields, and you can even uh, go beyond scalar fields, and you can uh, go beyond standard kinetic terms, you can go beyond standard initial conditions, etc., and all combinations of them. So phenomenologically, you really have lots of inflation models. And given the limited number of observables, it is very difficult, if possible at all, to uh, pin down the exact inflation model from all these models. Uh, so there is a difficulty. I'm not saying it's not important, but uh, it's difficult. And by the way of cosmological collider, we are trying to find out a complementary way to extract the high energy physics inflation, uh, to add the high energy physics information from inflation. What we want to do is we start not from a particular inflation model, but we start from the defining feature of inflation, which is the ex exponential exp expansion. Uh, the scale factor expands as e to the ht. So this is our starting point. And then uh, we try to be as model independent as possible and to read off the information about mass, about spin, width, and CP of the particles that existed during inflation, and then Using the information of these particles, we pass uh, this information of what particles are there during inflation. We tell this to the particle theorists, to the string theorists, and then they may make a connection to their own models. Uh, this is the proposal. And now let me go into the details. First, what is uh, the impact of mass during inflation? And again, we step back to see that what's the impact of mass in general on a collider. For example, this is, uh, this is the discovery of Higgs on the LHC for Atlas, for example, and there is a corresponding one at CMS. And what you see is there is a bump on the, uh, uh, the energy as a function, uh, so the events as a uh, event number as a function of energy. And that bump corresponding a so-called resonant peak corresponds to a particle. And I'd like to remind you that not only for expected particles such as Higgs, but also for some unexpected particles, once we see the resonance peak with a large enough confidence level, then that is a detection of a particle. For example, the most recent one, I'd like to remind you the 750 GeV. Uh, eventually, unfortunately, it's statistical fluctuation, uh, but uh, you, you can, probably remember that there is a peak. We don't know what it is, but it's an indication of a particle. And if uh, just in a parallel universe that becomes true, uh, that becomes a particle. Okay, the lesson here is uh, on the correlation function, here cross section, but related to the correlation function, on the correlation function, if there is a peak, that corresponds to a particle. And in our universe, something very similar happens, that during inflation, we have two types of particles. We have light particles, for example, the long-lived uh, long ones, 
for example, the inflation field and gravitational waves or isocurvature fluctuation if they're wrong. Uh, the long -lived, uh, these light particles, uh, the mass of the particle is much smaller than the Hubble parameter. And the dispersion relation for uh, this kind of light particle tells us that the in internal frequency of the particle uh, is time dependent, is the co-moving wave number divided by A. You know, yeah, the scale factor is exponentially expanding. That means the internal frequency of the light particle is exponentially decreasing. Now, this is the light particle. And there is also the heavy particle. The heavy particle is the particles uh, with mass of the Hubble parameter or higher. So later I will tell you the motivation. But here, let's assume there are heavy particles. And for these heavy particles, the internal frequency is determined by k over a squared and also the, uh, the rest mass of the particle. And uh, very soon after uh, uh, near or after horizon crossing, it will become the internal frequency will become of order the mass of the particle, which is time independent. So the, uh, the light particles and the heavy particles, they have different frequencies. Similar to uh, in conventional particle physics, we have resonance here. We have resonance or set of point approximation or whatever you say, very similarly. That uh, when we are calculating the correlation functions during inflation, we will have e to the minus i k tau, where uh, this k is the dispersion relation, is the internal frequency for the light particle. We also have oscillations such as e to the i m p, where the m is the internal frequency of the heavy particle. And at the moment, where the light particle and the heavy particle have very different frequencies, the oscillations cancel out each other. So the integral has a very small contribution. But at the moment, where the frequency of the light particle and heavy particle is close to each other, then the uh, oscillations are no longer there. So the integral gives us the largest contribution, which is the resonance or the set of point contribution. So this is the resonance we are talking about. And to have more details about the resonance, we can also take a look at the picture that what really happens in the early universe. Because of either the Hawking radiation in the DC space, or you understand that as quantum field theory in a time-dependent background, during inflation, uh, the heavy particles of mass of all the Hubble parameter, they can be uh, produced because of the time-dependent background. And this heavy particle, uh, if they interact with the uh, light particles, then it has a finite lifetime, and then the heavy particle decays. There is a preferred decay time for the heavy particle due to the resonance, which corresponds to the frequency of the light particle. I denote by the uh, black line here. The frequency coincides with the heavy particle, the red line here. So the k over a, which is the frequency of the light particle, is of order the mass of the heavy particle. So this is the preferred uh, interaction time for the heavy particle. Okay, so uh, decay or production. So here, maybe let, let me for the moment begin say production. Okay, so this is one interaction of the heavy particle. And then uh, the universe expands. And uh, so the produced heavy particle may have another chance to interact with the light particle when it decays. So there is another preferred interaction time, which is the decay time. Again, the preferred uh, interaction time is defined by the resonance. However, now, since the universe has expanded for some amount, the preferred interaction for this wavelength, uh, so the wavelength indicated here, is different from the original one. And by the way, because of the expansion of the universe, the original wavelength, uh, the bottom uh, black line, also expanded because of the expansion of the universe. And now, uh, so here, uh, the upper vertex about the decay, there is a preferred decay uh, resonance, which is also k, k over a of all the, the mass of the particle. Okay, so I mean that the physical wavelength at the second interaction is the same as the physical wavelength at the first interaction. But in cosmology, we are observing the uh, co-moving wave numbers. And the co-moving wave numbers are different. 
it's because of the expansion of the universe that uh, by the two times of interaction uh, for the massive particle, for the heavy particle, we are correlating the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the fluctuations of different wavelengths, uh, different physical wavelengths, I mean. Uh, oh, sorry, different co-moving wavelengths. So we are correlating the particles of different co-moving wavelengths for the light fields, for example, the curvature perturbation. And by definition, the correlation between uh, the fluctuations of different wavelengths for the curvature perturbation is non-Gaussianity for the curvature perturbation. Here I'm showing the example of four-point correlation function. And for three-point uh, for three-point correlation function, there are similar things, although there are some technical uh, dif differences. And here I'm showing that uh, uh, the two times of resonances can correlate the uh, long wavelength fluctuation and short wavelength fluctuation during inflation. And what the correlation function looks like. Again, we'd, we'd like to look like, we'd like to look at something which is uh, from first principle instead of uh, uh, from models. And the first principle here is the heavy particle has mass of all the Hubble parameter and the dispersion relation quickly become non-relativistic. So the mass is also its frequency. In other words, the energy of the state is uh, almost known. So for a state uh, with almost known energy, uh, after the state evolved for a given time, that state changed by a phase. Uh, this is just elementary quantum mechanics. So by correlating the long wavelength fluctuation to the short wavelength fluctuation, actually all what we are doing is uh, the correlation function has a change of phase. So the correlation function is uh, proportional to e to the i m delta t, where delta t is uh, the interaction time of the short wavelength mode minus the interaction time of the long wavelength mode. And then we are using the defining feature of inflation and also the feature of the resonance that the defining feature of inflation is the scale factor is exponential of t. So its scale factor is e to the ht. So the uh, t here is replaced by the, the logarithm of the scale factor. And the logarithm of the scale factor by the resonance condition is replaced by the logarithm of k over the mass. And then exponential of logarithm can be written as the ratio of k by some imaginary power. So this is oscillation, but oscillation in logarithm scale frequencies. And this kind of frequency can be considered as the fingerprint of inflation. And later I will tell uh, from an another perspective. But nevertheless, uh, this kind of oscillation, the logarithm kind of oscillation is a model independent uh, uh, observational quantity, which can tell us uh, the mass of the particle in Hubble units during inflation through resonance and everything else is just defining feature of inflation and also the elementary principle of quantum mechanics of phase change. So uh, this is about the, uh, how uh, do we see the mass of particles during inflation. Okay, and by the way, so uh, the heavy particle has a nice feature that it remains a uh, single particle state if the mass is greater than two halves of the Hubble parameter, uh, three halves of the Hubble parameter. And uh, for, uh, for light particles, the particle number increases exponentially. So uh, as a result, the heavy field is also a way uh, to prove the quantum nature of different inflation. Okay, so this is how do we read of the mass of the particle different inflation through the correlation functions in a model independent way. Now let me talk also a little bit about spin. So for spin, uh, we uh, notice that the intermediate heavy particle, again, we notice the feature, it is non-relativistic. So more or less, we can understand it as just uh, a particle is staying here, and then the particle decays. And then what is the angular distribution of the decay product? Again, this is a very standard particle physics problem and it's even written in female lecture notes. And uh, how, uh, I, I just remind you how we do it. For example, let us consider the story where 
uh, there is a spin one item uh, which decays into a photon. And what happens is, uh, uh, let's consider the, uh, the uh, angular momentum of the item is uh, pointing to the positive z direction. In this case, uh, because of, uh, uh, so uh, let's consider the case where uh, the outgoing photon is also in the, uh, in the positive z axis. In this case, there are two possibilities. Either uh, we have the uh, red hand helicity, uh, uh, red hand uh, circular polarized photon uh, in the z direction, uh, or uh, we have an uh, an, uh, uh, opposite uh, angular momentum uh, uh, if uh, the item uh, has an angular momentum which is uh, pointing downwards. So if the original item uh, angular momentum points upwards, we have a red uh, uh, circular polarized photon. And if the item angular momentum points downwards, we have a left uh, circular uh, uh, polarized photon. And uh, the m equal to zero uh, outcoming state is, uh, uh, sorry, m to zero initial state of the item is uh, uh, forbidden uh, because of angular momentum conservation. If we consider uh, the photon is running in the z direction. Okay, so this is just the angular momentum conservation. And the next question is, what if uh, the initial item and the, uh, the, the initial spin of the item and uh, the, outgoing, uh, the outgoing photon uh, has an angle, has an angle theta? Okay, uh, in this case, uh, very naively it appears to be a more difficult problem, but actually it's as simple as before. If we notice that uh, a item which is uh, has been in an arbitrary direction, nothing uh, but a linear superposition of m equal to minus one and zero and one. I mean the uh, uh, the angular momentum equal to minus one, zero and one states. And zero state is uh, forbidden. So just a, a superposition of m equal to zero. Sorry, m equal to minus one and m equal to one state. And also uh, notice that uh, these two states, uh, m2 equal to minus one and one states, actually uh, the dynamics about the uh, interaction is related by a, a parity transformation and the rotation. So uh, the amplitude uh, here A and B must be the same. So as a result, uh, the amplitude eventually is just a superposition which contributes to you one plus cosine theta and one mi mi minus cosine theta factors, and the one here cancels. Uh, so eventually, the amplitude is just the cosine theta. Uh, so uh, this is nothing new, uh, but really elementary uh, particle physics. And again, uh, in standard particle physics, it is also generalized to arbitrary spin. Uh, here, I take integer spin, for example, uh, since it's more observable in uh, a cosmology. For integer spin, the angular distribution of the outgoing particles uh, has a distribution of Ps of cosine theta, where Ps is the Legendre polynomial. And in cosmology, we have exactly the same thing, because in cosmology, simply we have a, a particle which is at rest, the heavy particle, and then uh, we see the correlation between the two times of interaction. So, uh, the angular dependence, again, uh, satisfying this Ps cosine theta rule. So uh, by in the late universe, by measuring the correlation functions on the CMB or on the large scale structure, uh, for example, four point correlation function, once we see this Ps cosine theta, then we can directly infer in the early universe that corresponds to what kind of spin of the particle. And we can also study the parity or CP of the parity or CP of the particle. Uh, the, for example, uh, in a toy model, we studied uh, this interaction, uh, which is uh, almost a Chen Simons term modulated by a time dependent, for example, axion field, which could be inflated or could be not inflated. So if we have this kind of interactions, this kind of interactions. Uh, is, uh, has different CP from a CP even particle. Uh, so as a result, uh, we can either probe CP old particles or the CP violation of a CP even particle by probing this kind of uh, interaction. And in particle physics, uh, 
uh, people use, for example, the decay plane correlation uh, to probe the CP of the particle by seeing that two planes of the decay, for example, of the decay of the Higgs, has correlation. And in cosmology, we, do, we can do exactly the same thing, that by seeing the correlation in a four-point correlation function, uh, which has a angle dependence between the two planes, where each plane is defined by two of the external momentum. Uh, if there are only uh, CP even interactions, uh, what we can see is uh, the correlation function is even as a function of the angle of the two planes. However, if there are CP odd particles or the CP odd interactions, then uh, the, correlation fun uh, the correlation function can have a a part which is uh, which is odd as a function of this angle, and turns out that part is also a imaginary part of the correlation function in momentum space, uh, because you know the a position space correlation function by definition has to be real, and then uh, the momentum space correlation function, if it is CP odd, that means there is a k dependence, and the k dependence means the uh, ik dependence. So the momentum space correlation function has an imaginary part which indicates uh, the parity or CP of the interactions in the primordial universe. Okay, and uh, this is the CP. And also in particle physics, we are also interested in the width uh, information about particles. For example, the width of the Higgs field, etc. And in cosmological collider physics, we can also extract the information about uh, the width of the particle. Uh, and uh, here it is a little bit different from particle physics, depending on how we define the width of the particle. Uh, there are a few things that can be defined. First of all, we can measure the decay rate uh, of the particle, which, uh, uh, which uh, there is a oscillatory part, plus minus i mu, and there is also a three plus gamma over h part. And here three simply means three special dimensions, meaning that during the expansion of the universe, the particle gets diluted. So the probability to find the particle uh, scales at, as the scale factor to the minus three power. And by the way, there is over two because we are looking at the amplitude, uh, the uh, wave function instead of the uh, square of the amplitude. So uh, there is a three factor uh, meaning the dilution. And you know, uh, the massive particle could disappear, not only because it's diluted by the expansion of the universe, but also uh, by the particle decays. So the three uh, should appear uh, by a combination of the gamma over H factor, where the gamma, uh, the gamma is the decay rate of the particle, can be considered as the width of the particle. So if we, can, if we have a, a particle, which is heavy enough that we have an oscillatory factor, and then, we can measure that the real exponent is different from uh, three halves. Uh, that means uh, there is a width of the particle. You know, the measurement is difficult, but at least in principle, uh, this is the information uh, we can read off. And also, there are other things related to uh, the width of the particle after the Fourier transform. For example, the thermal motion of the particle or the Higgs mechanism, et cetera. And here, let me skip this part. Okay, so here, uh, all I am saying so far is uh, if there are particles of mass of all the Hubble parameter or slightly heavier during inflation, what are the, uh, what are the model independent uh, observational consequences that we can extract from these particles? And as a recap, the, uh, the observables are the mass of the particle can be extracted by uh, if we change the shape of the triangle by pulling, uh, pulling this vertex, by pulling the vertex on the right, by pulling this vertex, we can uh, know the mass of the particle. And also, by tilting uh, the shorter edge, by tilting uh, this line, the momentum, we can know the spin of the particle. And also by changing, uh, so uh, for three-point correlation function, it's always on a plane. So we are unable to see the parity information. But if we go further to four-point correlation function, by seeing uh, how the correlation function goes uh, by mirror symmetry configurations, uh, then 
we can know the parity of the particle. So we can read off uh, this information in a model independent way, uh, just assuming our universe undergoes inflation. Okay, then there could be another question that, so since now you have a cosmological collider, what is the target physics on the cosmological collider? Or maybe you can ask the question in another way, which is you, all you are saying is you assume there is a massive particle uh, whose mass is about the Hubble parameter or higher. Okay, uh, why there could be massive particles at mass of all the Hubble parameter or the same order? Is it a coincidence or is there any physical principles to ask us to have these particles? Okay, uh, this is the next part I'm going to address. So what is happening at the energy scale of Hubble? First of all, it could be a coincidence uh, uh, so later I will say uh, uh, it had better not, but it could be a coincidence. For example, if the Hubble scale of inflation is uh, 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 GeV, in this, co in this case, accidentally, lower than the grand unification, but not too much lower. So if there are some small coupling constants, it's possible to bring some massive states of the grand unification to the energy scale of all the Hubble parameter. And also the neutrino CISO mechanism is uh, probably at uh, 10 to the 13 GeV. So probably it, it could be accidentally at the energy scale of inflation. So this is one, one thing that could happen at Hubble scale, which is accidental. But uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of other physics which is not accidental. Uh, no matter the inflation scale is rare, uh, no matter inflation scale is uh, 10 to the 13 GeV or 10 to the 10 GeV or even uh, 10 GeV or even 10 to minus something GeV, no matter where is the inflationary scale, uh, possibly there are uh, some uh, uh, possibly there are some observational consequences. For example, uh, what about the standard model of particle physics? As long as the inflationary scale is higher than 100 GeV then uh, the standard model should be uplifted to the energy scale of inflation, unless you uh, stabilize the standard model by some other ways. If you don't do anything, then the particle physics standard model will be on the energy scale of inflation. Why I say that? This is because the only dimensionful parameter in the standard model is the mass of the Higgs particle, and during inflation, uh, Higgs get an effective mass. How the Higgs get an effective mass is because, yeah, so in principle, uh, in the calculation, you can calculate the one loop diagram and then to resum the IR divergence. But here, let us use an intuitive estimation that we can uh, subdivide the Higgs uh, uh, particle, uh, the Higgs uh, fluctuation into the long wavelength fluctuation and the short wavelength fluctuation. Uh, the long wavelength fluctuation uh, is uh, assuming the Higgs is light, uh, the mass is less than Hubble parameter, then the long wavelength fluctuation, uh, the two point function is about the Hubble parameter uh, uh, from the standard calculation of quantum field theory in curved space time. And then consider the self interaction, the lambda Higgs 4 interaction. For this self interaction, we can, uh, so there, uh, there is a term lambda. Higgs long wavelength fluctuation squared and Higgs short wavelength fluctuation squared. There is such a term uh, contained in this lambda Higgs four term. And uh, from this term, the long wavelength fluctuation can be considered as classical. So we replaced by the two point function of the Higgs field. So as a result, uh, for the short wavelength fluctuation, you can consider everything else uh, in, in front of this expression, lambda Higgs squared expectation as an effective mass of the particle. And uh, this is of all the Hubble parameter up to coupling constants. And here, actually, I'm not so uh, careful about the coupling constants. Otherwise, it's a different power. OK, so that means if we don't do anything else, but just leave the standard model to be as it is, then the mass scale of the particle physics standard model will be at the Hubble scale. And uh, we have also worked out uh, the detailed phenomenology 
of particle physics standard model given inflation that if the Hubble scale is light, if the Hubble scale is, for example, an order of magnitude smaller than the Hubble parameter, then the W and Z particles get a mass which is heavier than the Hubble parameter. And on the other hand, if the Higgs is heavy, then the mass of the W and Z particles, uh, the mass is smaller than the Hubble parameter. Why it is the case is because if the Higgs particle is light, then the Higgs can have relatively larger fluctuations and a larger two-point correlation function. And the two large two-point correlation function of the Higgs particle can, uh, of the Higgs field can give large mass to the WZ particles. And if the Higgs is very heavy, the two-point correlation function of the Higgs field is small. So the mass of the WZ are small. And also supersymmetry. So uh, uh, we know that supersymmetry uh, usually has to be broken uh, in the sitter space. And uh, the minimum uh, breaking scale of the supersymmetry is by defined by the expansion of the universe, which is the Hubble parameter. And assuming that originally there are light particles whose mass is, pro uh, is protected by uh, the supersymmetry. Then, during inflation, the supersymmetry is broken, and this field uh, could have a mass of all the Hubble parameters. Well, here I assume there are some particles whose mass is protected by supersymmetry breaking, uh, which may not be necessarily the case by some study. But nevertheless, uh, studying supersymmetry can also be a motivation for searching for uh, uh, the fields uh, whose mass is of all the Hubble parameters. OK, so this is the physics of the mass of all the Hubble parameter. And in the, uh, in the last part, I have also been talking about uh, if there are fields uh, whose mass is of all the Hubble parameter, and if they are uh, coupled to the inflated field, then there should be signatures such as the mass resonance, the angular, the angular uh, uh, dependence of the correlation function, which is the spin, and also the parity, and also the V. So, so far, it appears good. Uh, but I'd like uh, also to mention, indeed, uh, so there are also a lot of difficulties uh, for the study of cosmological collider physics. And the key difficulty is it's very difficult to observe. We know that so far, we haven't seen non-Gaussianity yet. So uh, in the future, so there are indeed a number of uh, uh, ongoing and future experiments which can improve the non-Gaussianity uh, precision by an order of magnitude, and in the future, even a few orders of magnitudes. But after all, uh, the precision is bounded by cosmological variance. So we have limited number of data. Uh, so uh, from here, uh, this is the cosmological collider in this very challenging uh, observational proposal. And on the other hand, there are also some other limitations, which in some cases can be relaxed. For example, uh, previously all I'm saying is limited to the mass of all the Hubble parameter or uh, smaller than Hubble parameter. If the mass is larger than Hubble parameter, there will be a Boltzmann factor similar to the particle production rate in thermal field. So there is a Boltzmann factor to exponentially suppress uh, the production rate of heavy particles compared to Hubble parameter. As a result, it's very difficult to see the heavy fields. And also, by observing very squeezed limits, you know, on CMB, we can hardly uh, observe very squeezed limits, and not to mention uh, uh, their fluctuations, since we only have 10 efforts to observe on the CMB. And uh, on large-scale structure, we may be able to extend a little bit, but still, very squeezed limits is very challenging. And also, uh, the coupling between the inflated can also uh, give, uh, give us some model-dependent pollution uh, from uh, studying the mass of the particle. For example, uh, the mass of the particles could be dependent on the coupling to the inflated, uh, which is pretty model-dependent. Okay, so uh, first of all, future experiments can try to solve the uh, FNL too small to observe problem, at least partially. And there are also a number of proposals to solve the problem of uh, 
uh, if we can observe larger mass particles and the challenge that at the very squeeze the limit of pollution from uh, couplings. For example, if in some inflation models, especially some uh, axial monotomy uh, inspired inflation models, that if there is a periodic potential, uh, the per periodicity of the potential can be considered as uh, external particle production energy, uh, which can give us, uh, which can produce much heavier uh, particles compared to the Hubble parameter. Up to uh, the mass of the uh, particle is up to 60 times the Hubble parameter. Similarly, one can study higher temperature and one can study the chemical potential uh, and one can study the iso curvature collider to address these problems. And uh, personally, I'm more interested uh, in the chemical potential proposal uh, since it's uh, pretty elegant and, uh, and natural. Yeah, but here, let me not to expand uh, very much on these proposals. Okay, so this is about uh, the particle physics that we can see from inflation. And using the remaining 10 minutes also, let me also mention that uh, the cosmological collider proposal can also be understood in another way that we can also understand better about the evolution history of our universe uh, from observing the cosmological collider signal. Uh, let me tell the story in this way. In 2017, probably you all have heard about uh, there is a big debate about inflation or alternative to inflation. So some people say that inflation has facing very big challenges and uh, a group of 33 phases uh, write a fight back saying that inflation is perfectly okay. So here, I don't want to get involved into uh, this fight, but by showing you this figure, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, so uh, you, you may have a question that uh, from uh, a decade ago, we have been saying that now we have entered a precision era of cosmology. Okay, so we are saying that we understand our universe very well, up to a few percents in precision. But for the theory of inflation, okay, uh, there is even debate, yeah, no matter who is right, who is wrong, there is even debate about our primordial universe is expanding or contracting, okay? So that means we don't understand our universe well at all. Okay, who is right? Are we really in a precision era of our universe? Or we don't understand our universe at all? Uh, actually, we can say it in this way. We understand some aspects of our universe very well. The aspect that we understand our universe very well is we understand the size of the fluctuation as a function of commoving scales very well, okay? For example, on the CMB, we have measured the size of fluctuation as a function of commoving scales up to cosmic variance for a large range of scales. So we understand that very well. In the language of the early universe cosmology, that means we understand the size of the fluctuation as a function of conformal time very well, because conformal time corresponds to the so-called horizon crossing time of this scale. So we understand the size of the fluctuation as a function of conformal time in the primordial universe. However, what is conformal time? Conformal time is the proper time uh, up to a, a coordinate transformation. So it is uh, not so physical compared to the physical time or the proper time in the FRW coordinate. What is the uh, size of the fluctuation as a function of physical time during inflation? Actually, we have very little information. Oh, we even have no information. So uh, conceptually, that can be thought of as we have a lot of uh, movie uh, clips. We have a lot of uh, the movie film, uh, but we have lost the index. We have lost uh, which film uh, corresponds to which time step. We not even know if the upper one and the little one, which is uh, earlier, which is later. So as a result, we don't know what happens. 
And here, uh, by the order and also the time duration of each film, actually, I mean physical time. Uh, what we really don't know is we don't know the physical time uh, corresponding to the uh, to the conformal time during inflation. That's why we don't even know if our inflation, if our early universe is inflation or is bouncing or is uh, any alternative to inflation. For sure, here I'm not attacking inflation. Inflation is still the best model so far, the best scenario so far. But uh, it is nice that we can find a way to experimentally, to observationally, to observe if the primordial universe is inflation or is not inflation. And by seeing the heavy particles actually provide a way to do so. Why? Because again, the oscillatory frequency of the heavy particle, which is exponential to the IMT, where the mass of the particle n is a physical parameter. So that means the oscillatory frequency of the massive particle is a physical time. So once we see the imprint of the massive particle, once we see the imprint of E to the IMT, that means actually we are seeing a functional dependence. We are seeing the physical time as a function of conformal time. What is the physical time as a function of conformal time? And by definition, differentiate this equation, you get the scale factor. In other words, by seeing the correlation function, what is the frequency of the oscillation look like? Actually, we are directly observing the intention of the primordial universe. We are directly observing what is the scale factor as a function of t. For example, if we model the scale factor as a function of t to be uh, t to the pth power, which can model a lot of inflation and alternative models, then we can calculate that the correlation function is proportional to cosine of some factor. And then k1 over k3, a long wavelength mode divided by the short wavelength mode to the one over p power. And here, this one over p power is actually the inverse function of scale factor as a function of t. That means by observing uh, this uh, oscillatory frequency and by numerically, by observationally fitting what is the p parameter, actually we are directly observing the expansion history or even contracting history of the primordial universe. Oh, we are really testing inflation from this method. And uh, I'm running uh, almost out of time, but let me just mention that although we are uh, emphasizing the model independent features of cosmological collider physics, it can also have interesting uh, impact on models, inflation models. For example, the simplest inflation model in the market is m squared phi squared. So what is simpler than a mass term? However, the m squared phi squared model uh, corresponding to the green solid line in this uh, image is at the boundary of three sigma, which means it's probably not uh, ruled out, but uh, it is uh, a not fitting data very well, produce too much gravitational waves. However, if we consider the, uh, if we consider the correction, from the heavy fields, the correction will give us larger uh, power spectrum. Uh, and uh, by normalizing the power spectrum by the Kobe normalization, uh, that means relatively, it will give us smaller contribution of gravitational waves. In other words, a smaller tensor to scalar ratio. And as a result, we will pull these models down in this NSR diagram. Well, it's something uh, pretty, uh, in the, uh, in the diagram, something pretty similar to our alpha attractor, although it's a different magnitude. So there are also impacts on inflation models that, for example, the m square phi square uh, could be pulled uh, to a very real uh, compared to the best fit value again. Uh, if the interaction between the inflator and the massive particle is relatively strong. Okay, finally, let me summarize. 
uh, the take home message about cosmological collider physics uh, is like this. So uh, if very naively, very naively, if we knew the cosmological correlation functions infinitely precisely, it's impossible. But just if uh, we know that, then we will know the mass, the spin, the parity, the width of all the heavy fields that existed during inflation. And for sure, we are not uh, knowing uh, uh, the correlation function infinitely precisely. Uh, so uh, we are not knowing all the fields during inflation, uh, but by uh, pushing the observational limits down and down, we hope that we can find some evidence of some of the fields, for example, the mass, spin, CP, etc. And we have been talking about the particle physics phenomenology on the uh, cosmological collider, including standard model, beyond standard model. And we have also mentioned a little bit, but not too much, about uh, chemical potential and isocurvature. And finally, uh, this uh, claim uh, can be also considered as a measurement of the evolution history of the primordial universe, since the oscillatory signal is just the inverse function of the expansion of the scale factor as a function of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yeah. Uh, questions? Um, yes, I have one question. Uh, to the slides, uh, um, the one before. Uh, um, yeah, there you have this MT. So this measurement only works if the uh, mass is constant, right? So if oh, you would have some... That's an excellent question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Actually, there are two things. Uh, there are, there are uh, two things can, uh, uh, can uh, invalid, invalidate uh, uh, this assumption. Yes, here I am assuming that the mass is a constant, which I think is not a too big assumption in particle yep. physics. But on the other hand, uh, 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 there were papers uh, by a number of people uh, originally in, in Kyoto, uh, Misao Sasaki and uh, uh, Gilliam, uh, and also a few other collaborators. So uh, there were papers say, uh, uh, studying that given inflation, uh, the interactions might uh, bring some time-dependent de mass, and then that time-dependent mass can uh, confuse inflation with some alternative to inflation uh, from the study of the correlation function. Yeah, so uh, there, there was such study. And recently, uh, I, actually, I was also working on something uh, uh, which is uh, giving alternative to inflation. I'm trying to destroy myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> during the alternative to inflation, uh, actually, there are also some uh, pretty natural time dependence arising from Hubble parameter. So I mentioned arising from Hubble parameter is pretty natural, and uh, that can also mimic uh, the signal of inflation. However, uh, that's also, uh, sorry, that only affects the, uh, uh, the shape of non gaussianity And actually, during inflation, there is the prediction of, uh, of scale, almost the scale dependent size of non gaussianity et cetera. Uh, which is uh, uh, in what I mentioned is hard to uh, is uh, is hard to mimic. Uh, so indeed, uh, there are something can mimic that. And I'd like to also draw similarity to the story of gravitational waves. So gravitational wave is considered primordial primordial gravitational wave is considered to be a way to test inflation. Uh, and I, I think uh, this claim is good. But on the other hand, uh, so there are also uh, some models, for example, yeah, alternative to inflation models, you can have some interaction which can also give you a uh, scale uh, independent, uh, a scale, uh, scale invariant uh, primordial gravitational wave spectrum uh, to, uh, to mimic inflation. Yeah, indeed. So once we go to more complicated models, indeed we can mimic, uh, 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 mimic inflation or mimic uh, alternative. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay, thanks for the answer. Hey, can you say more about the um, chemical potential? Uh, chemical, poten chemical potential proposal. Ah, chemical potential, yes. Can you say a few words about that? Ah, right. Yes. 
uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't, uh, I, 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 yeah, actually I go to chemical potential, that doesn't mean a lot. Yeah, because I didn't, uh, I hardly write anything on it. Yeah, so uh, previously, accidentally, we noticed the chemical potential when we were studying the uh, uh, Weinberg parameter in, uh, uh, in studying neutrino uh, in cosmological collider, uh, which is uh, uh, the uh, psi bar gamma five uh, uh, phi and uh, psi, uh, the Weinberg uh, 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 operator. And then uh, in a later paper by uh, Lian Tao Wang and Zhongzhi Xianyu, uh, they studied chemical potential uh, much more systematically, uh, and they uh, put amphor, uh, they studied two things. One is the same Weinberg, uh, Weinberg uh, uh, operator, and another is the Chen Simons coupling. Uh, and by the way, we also studied that in the CP paper. And uh, since they are the dimension five operator, which is also uh, relatively natural. And uh, the chemical potential uh, can be, yeah, so uh, let, let me say it in this way. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a uh, no matter in the Chen Simons coupling or in the uh, Weinberg coupling, uh, by uh, applying the equation of motion, we can uh, write that into a uh, derived, uh, derivative uh, coupling uh, to the scalar field. Uh, in other words, phi dot. And during inflation, actually, uh, I, I don't really like the word slow row of inflation because phi dot is actually huge compared to Hubble parameter. Phi dot is 3,000 Hubble square, uh, which is just another way to say the power spectrum of inflation is small. Okay, phi dot is 3,000 Hubble square. That means square root of phi dot, the energy scale of phi dot is 60 Hubble. Uh, that means by a, uh, by a term, which is phi dot couples to something else, that can create uh, the mass of the particle up to 60 Hubble, which is much higher than the Hubble parameter. Yeah, this is just a, a, from the number of uh, the size of phi dot and then dimensional analysis. And there are also a lot of detailed calculations. Yeah, by the way, so uh, I, I, I was saying I uh, discovered, but actually I, we didn't discover chemical potential, yeah, not even in cosmology. In the past, there are a ton of work in dark matter and in the uh, inflationary particle production, et cetera, studying chemical potential. We just accidentally rediscovered this in the context of cosmological collider physics. And uh, if we create particle of order, for example, 10 Hubble or even 60 Hubble, uh, what is the uh, uh, consequence? The number one is theoretically it is uh, interesting uh, because uh, theoretically, uh, depending on which UV model you prefer. Let me just uh, take the example of string theory. So, uh, so far, almost uh, all the inflation model derived by string theory is effective field theory actually of strings derived by string theory. So we are not actually seeing the string states. So the string scale is higher compared to the inflationary scale. However, uh, if we are able to probe uh, an order of magnitude or even more uh, compared, to, uh, compared to Hubble scale, uh, there is a larger chance uh, that we see something more related to string theory. For example, a tower of high spin states uh, which can be a prediction of string theory in various limits. So uh, uh, this is a nice thing about chemical potential. And another thing, uh, observationally, is if we look at the squeezed limit, if we look at extremely squeezed limit, it's very difficult to see on the CMD. Uh, this is because we have uh, 10 efforts of observing, uh, of observable window on the CMD. And the first a few efforts are also uh, highly uh, cosmic variance limited. And in the large scale structure, we are not going a, a lot more. So uh, going very squeezed limit is very end. On the other hand, if we have a large chemical potential, uh, that means actually uh, within uh, one Hubble, uh, so within one effort, there could be already a lot of oscillations in it. I'm not sure what is the best template, uh, what, what's the best uh, observational method, uh, data analysis method to see that, but just uh, from a theorist's naive expectation, uh, that should be easier to see. Uh, 
uh, either on the CMB or on the large scale structure. And by the way, uh, by the way, so uh, currently uh, for the mass, uh, which is smaller than three half Hubble, uh, Planck, Planck data already had limits, uh, but for larger mass, uh, larger than three half Hubble, uh, especially for the case of chemical potential, uh, as far as I know, so far there is uh, uh, no study even for the exa existing CMB data, uh, which probably uh, is an interesting thing to see, uh, uh, to test the cosmology. Uh, okay, so this is what I want to say about it. That's great, thank you. Okay, can I ask a question about uh, the Higgs mechanism? First of all, yeah. thank you for uh, fascinating ideas in your, in your talk. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I had this question about the, the Higgs mechanism. Of course, I understand that, uh, you know, the correlator which you computed here, H squared, is usually generated for, for the single scalar field, um, any scalar field with a mass less than Hubble, Hubble scale, right? Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the right. mechanism per se involves also spontaneous symmetry breaking which assumes that uh, the vacua per se are degenerate, right? At least, uh, you know, and, uh, and well. Oh, oh uh, this is an excellent question. We know that in the sitter space, there might be tunneling between the vacua. Well, how, how do I know that this is the ground state indeed? Uh, and why? why oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. This is an excellent question. Uh, so there are three possibilities, uh, either, uh, the electrowave symmetry is uh, restored because of the thermal effect. So the Higgs is staying at the bottom of the potential. Or the electrowave symmetry is broken. Uh, uh, the Higgs staying at the broken vacuum. And also there is a possibility that because of the instability of the electrowave potential at high energy, it could be anywhere else. Uh, it's in very far away vacuum. Uh, so here, for the moment being, I'm not considering uh, that the electrowave symmetry Okay, sorry, I'm not considering uh, uh, the Higgs tunneling to another vacuum due to the RG uh, running. Uh, and actually, there, there are papers uh, studying that. I, I, I probably... I'm not saying that. So, uh, actually, that, suppose you have a stable vacuum, right? Suppose yeah. symmetry, you have a double wall potential, with just right. for simplicity. Right. Now, if, uh, in usual case, in Minkowski space, if you're stuck in yeah. one vacuum, you can choose that vacuum and that's it. But in the Cedar space, there is still tunneling between minus and plus vacua in principle. Now, uh, as ah. quantum mechanics, right? So with quantum mechanics, you don't have, and then, and then the true vacuum is actually the superposition of this plus and minus, and the symmetry is restored. You don't have, for example, breaking of symmetry in, uh, in quantum mechanics, right? Where these transitions are uh, not right. Now, of course, obviously, this something should should be assumed about the expansion rate or, or the transition rates. You know, there are various instantons in the Cedar space, like Hawking moss and things like that. Even which, uh, you know, there is a transition between degenerate. Mm. Right. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, at first I apologize because the other question was so frequently asked. I thought you were asking another question. Now I think I understand. Uh, right, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, so I, I think you know the story that in quantum field theory, uh, so that uh, uh, we are actually not in a superposition of the two wheel, uh, but actually in a one of the wheel. Yeah, and in the space, uh, in uh, in the space, uh, first uh, I assume that if uh, well, uh, first of all, well, uh, there are a few things. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And uh, I, I think I, I need to say at least uh, two or three points. Uh, the number one is. Uh, similar to in thermal field theory, actually, uh, if the uh, if the Hubble parameter is much higher than uh, the uh, the standard model scale 100 GeV, then uh, the quantum fluctuations, uh, uh, something similar to the thermal effect, can stabilize the electrowave potential. So actually, uh, the fluctuation that uh, so the Higgs doesn't really see the double wheel. So similar to in thermal high temperature universe. Yeah, this is one thing. And the other thing is, on the other hand, indeed, it's possible that during inflation, uh, Higgs is in a electrowave broken phase. That is because uh, there could be a, uh, there could be a, a, a non-minimal coupling, uh, the Higgs squared coupled to the Ricci scalar, 
which is dimension four operator, naturally to be order one coefficient. And then uh, this can also contribute a mass of the Higgs or for the Hubble parameter. If the sign of the mass squared is negative, uh, this term can trigger the electrowave phase transition in the early universe. And then uh, uh, the Higgs uh, indeed uh, could stay in one of the vacuum uh, instead of staying at the middle. And in that case, uh, indeed, uh, indeed one uh, should consider the instanton effects. And uh, uh, first, uh, to the best of my, of my knowledge, I, I, at least uh, it's not studied in cosmological collider physics. Yeah, so this instant in fact, I'm sure is in Coleman de Lucia and also uh, probably is also in inflation. I remember there were some papers. Yeah, but uh, first we didn't study it. And well, if we study it, what, what do we expect? Uh, well, there is the whole thing about the Sitter space and the environment, right? right? Uh, because the correlators are divergent and things like that, right? So right. Related with whether whether you can have really a breaking of in uh, symmetry, a spontaneous breaking of symmetry in this. Uh, right, right. But yeah. I, so uh, here I am uh, exactly. So here uh, I am taking a pretty phenomenological point of view because we are not staying in an eternal DC space, and inflation will eventually end. And what we observe is six efforts of inflation, uh, and we understand the Higgs field. Uh, as a, a relatively light, light scalar field, uh, which is uh, in a random work solution. So uh, indeed, probably the extremely long wavelength mode could be in a different vacuum, but as long as uh, the last six efforts are in one of the vacuum, uh, I think we are more or less fine. Uh, yeah, so uh, indeed there are some instant corrections, but probably uh, phenomenologically, maybe it's not relevant. Okay. No more questions for you. Okay, if not, um, thank you very much. It was very interesting. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, uh, we hope to, to see you in person. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, hope the situ situation ends soon. Yeah, and we all meet in person in all conferences. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.